listeners, welcome to another episode of the Unredacted Project. This is our third episode from the series Dharv or Hums in collaboration with Black Sheep. I am Prerna Dadu and I'm joined by Ananya Naren, who's going to be a special host and Black Sheep co-founder Pooja. Our very special guest for today, who has very graciously agreed to speak to us, is Professor Amit Bindal. Amit Bindal is an associate professor at Jindal Global Law School of O.P. Jindal Global University, where he has taught criminal law and constitutional law for the past 12 years. He is also the managing director of Center for Knowledge Systems at JGU. His doctoral work explores the intersections of law, myth, and modernity. He completed his doctoral thesis from the Department of History. At present, he is teaching a course on constitutional theory and an elective on the course on law and religion. Welcome to our uh, podcast today. We're very excited to converse with you and talk more about religion and law. So let's start with um, India's constitution and its objectives seem to be in the in, in, the, in the tune of um, a liberal democratic uh, nature. So, and its objective is primarily to promote so- social transformation and maintain civil harmony. However, with the rising political tyranny, minorities facing carceral and violent ends for voicing their opinions, rigged elections, um, the constitution seems to be falling short. So what are your opinions on this? And can we even look to the constitution to protect and maintain religious tolerance in a society like India? Yeah, first of all, thank you, Prerna, Pooja, Ananya, all of you, and the the whole, I'm very thankful, genuinely, that you thought of me. And uh, that's a very good question, because uh, at one level, at one level, I think that I, I also like the the sort of the rubric of your talk, dharm and hum. And that's quite interesting because I want to say that, yes, at, at some level, we need to preserve the, the institutions, the, the texts that, ha- that we have. And at the same time, we need to constantly keep questioning them. <clears throat> we need to constantly reworking them that what are these words? Uh, For instance, the constitution itself. So on on the one hand, yes, I mean, certainly we we want the constitution and we want the liberal constitution to do the basic job of what is what, what lawyers call constitutionalism, by which they mean that putting limits on power, putting accountability on governance so that you have limitations on those who are ruling. But uh, at the same time, uh, we need to constantly think about that what is the constitution and how its meaning and how its interpretation is constantly changing over the time. And as I just said that the, the, the title of the series, Dharm and Hum. So again, that's a very fascinating term, Dharm, which is again, one of those words which we either think that we just know it or we think that it is unknowable, but we never struggle to sort of figure out this, the complexity of this very, very uh, interesting uh, term. So I think in some ways, yes, that we have to protect. I think we, we need the constitution, we need the liberal democratic setup, but we have to constantly keep questioning that what it means to us in different times. I think with the sort of, sort of base of uh, this whole thing would be that law, we are, we are trying to read psychoanalysis and religion and law together. So I'm starting with Hindu religion itself and how it has been understood by courts and outside, co- outside the courts. Let's start with that. So the first strand of this discussion would be um, that, as, as I understand it, that broadly there are two strands of critique for the Hindu religion, both uh, from the courts and outside the courts in the political sphere as well, uh, that because Hinduism is this tolerant and inclusive religion, and um, uh, so the the agenda or the uh, agenda behind the courts has always been that we are trying to include every religion or every distinct denomination within it. At least that's the major critique that's, critique that's been. And the other critique has been that um, because we have now said that Hindutva is a way of life that, that was done by the Supreme Court in the 1990s. What is its effect in the um, 
majoritarian uh, aspect of it like where do minority religions go if you're saying it's the way of life of all indians and here my question would be that it sounds very simplistic to say that uh, uh, like decades of interpretation by the courts of hinduism being an <coughs> inclusive religion maybe in some context or the other can be reduced to saying that it was it's it's um, it's what led to the uh, supreme court in the 1990s to interpret as hindutva being a way of life that it was just simply picked up and used by the courts so here my question would be can can, can we even how do we even understand the hinduism as an inclusive discourse by the courts because it doesn't seem to be this simple yeah that's a very profound question uh, ananya and i think you yourself work on this so i'm sort of very uh, glad that you brought this up uh so let me try to take uh because it's a very very uh, broad question so let me try to take and maybe open the strands of your question so that i think a lot can be contextualized and your question can be understood better uh and i and i'll begin with your very first reference to the notion of religion and psychoanalysis so i think i'll say a little bit on that that apparently psychoanalysis as a discipline is something which i feel is almost unknown at the moment uh, in the mainstream law school curriculum by which i mean that so when we use a term like psychoanalysis we should not think at all that this is something we understand because there is a lot of literature on psychoanalysis and law but as far as the mainstream law schools are concerned and i mean all so like whether it is the united states or whether it is europe europe or very much if you can i mean i i can bet you that you'll hardly find anything of this in law school across india on on this so i think that's a good question and this is a important discipline that psychoanalysis has a role to play and it is different from psychology which is very dominant which is something that we find everywhere and we just saw in the budget now that uh, there is something about mental health but psychoanalysis is something which is more complicated and more like important as a reading practice as how to read a text and text i'm using in the broadest sense as in not just a text book but it can be a judgment it can be a film it can be our lives okay the way once this french thinker Olaf Bartz used to say, you know, that making a distinction between work and text. So I think that's a good question. That this, how do we use this discipline to read the law? And then now, and, and I somehow feel that uh, this is a question which is very interestingly linked to your question on Hinduism and Hindutva. Okay, why? Because if psychoanalysis teaches us anything, so if I can really do a keyword, which I don't like generally, of this, because this is an unknown discipline. So if you have to sort of put uh, psychoanalysis into keywords, and one would say sexuality, one would say unconscious, and the third, which I want to focus for our discussion, is contradiction. By which I mean that psychoanalysis as a reading technique wants to read a text. without seeing it to be a text without contradiction so it is impossible that there's something which is not lacking uh, which is which is not having a crack inside it and one can learn a lot according to psychoanalysis by focusing on the cracks by focusing on the contradictions by focusing on slips as freud used to say you know which is again the something which is not really coherent in the text so i think that's a important insight because we generally want to make a uh, we, we generally are scared of failures and cracks and contradictions we like to be we like to be very positive and full and holistic so that in in that sense it's a very important discipline and with this i'll come to your question in some ways that yes that's true that one need to think about hinduism and to again the second strand of your question and to also sort of open it up for our listeners that this is a, there is a very 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 foundational decision of the indian supreme court which came in the 90s and it, this is again important because 90s is a very turbulent time in 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 various ways but especially for in the context of religion and although it's also market and mandal but 
it is also masjid and it is also a very you know major uh, demolition of babri masjid happens in 90s so in this sense i think and and this judgment which comes post that in that historical times I had a very simple question which is this that indian laws do not permit that there's only one statute in india which deals with all elections which is the representations of the people's act which was enacted way back in 1951 so that does not allow you to have an appeal in the name of religion so you cannot have a really religious appeal communal appeal uh now the question which was before the supreme court of india in this case which you mentioned uh was that whether hindutva is a religious appeal and the court and and the, obviously the some one side of the argument led by ramjit melani and others was saying that actually hindu hindutva is not any different from hinduism and hinduism is not a religion which is what you were suggesting and it is not a religion so what is it so it's it's a way of life and that is why you can't say it's a religious appeal and supreme court uh, agreed to that and uh, and they said that yes and in fact that is what justice j s verma who was who, who sort of wrote all these opinions three for four judgments he sort of categorically mentioned that hinduism is a way of life not a religion and therefore if anybody is take asking for votes even in the name of hinduism and hindutva he sort of thought that hinduism is not a religious appeal because hinduism is a way of life so you're basically not having any religious appeal at all and this sort of gave a latitude that today for example if we can like hindutva can become an easily open agenda of a lot of political parties bjp and others so in in that is that that has a the, the important thing is that it has a root in judicial discourse so it is the indian judiciary which has stamped this and again constitutionally stamped it that this is right you are legitimately appealing if you are saying that you are appealing in the name of uh, Hin- hinduism okay and and again the court never makes a distinction between hinduism and hindutva which a lot of commentators thought that that's a bit of a uh latitude the court is giving but this was the judgment which uh, you are referring to now coming to your third strand and which is the real question uh, but it was important to explain this to because i fundament to make a fundamental point that actually if we that's why it's important to read law and read judgments carefully because if we want to understand the appeal or the ascendance of hindutva okay then it is it is it is not something which you can just say all of a sudden people you know have become religious or all of a sudden political parties are just vehemently doing something but it is a very constitutionally sanctioned by a judge whom we sort of who's a very very respected and good judge so you can't say it's some we can't blame the judge we can't blame just anyone it's a justice verma's opinion became the fundamental premise and and, and, and an opinion which is also sort of celebrated and at least a uh, lot of agreed by someone as uh, learned as professor upendra bakshi who said that it's a, it, you should not think that it's a bad it's a wrong judgment or something uh, so so this is so my point this is my fundamental point that one has to notice this interesting uh, i would say genealogy okay this this interesting turn of events which happened in 1996 and which would sort of lead to uh, parties appealing in the name of hinduism and now finally coming directly to your question so now this is again the point so i will try to answer your question in two ways one a little legal uh, and one a little general so let me start with the general first so g- general point i'm say I-, i want to say that so what is the trope here is that for a long time for a long time indologists those who were studying religion comparative religions indian religions have somehow maintained this point that hinduism is something which is different from i mean they have said that hinduism is not a religion okay but what they actually mean if we read them carefully is that hinduism does not fit very well with the notion of religion that we generally understand 
And what is the meaning of generally? So generally means the dominant perception of religion, which we get from the European Judeo-Abrahamic tradition, okay, is that you have a God and you have a book, you have a you know book to follow and certain kind of precepts are there that are largely absent if those who study Hinduism and the most sort of, you can say, the most uh, authoritative and forceful statement of this position is taken by someone called Bal Gangadhar Tilak uh, in his very famous book, uh, The Heathen and His Blindness, where he sort of says that there's no question that like, Hinduism has nothing to do with religion. In fact, Hindus, uh, whoever these people are, Indic people, they never used, they never thought of the idea of religion at all. So this is the background on which this, this is the larger sort of historical background on which the court is in a way following. So this is, this becomes, and, and I'm sort of emphasizing this history because this becomes a very standard trope of saying that yes, so therefore Hinduism is different. So I have two points to make here. One, that this is a sort of reading. This is a sort of, so this is a kind of a comparative religious thought, comparative cultural work that is saying that certain worldviews, which when you are studying India, then and you can also have the same in Africa, for example, Ubuntu, the, the idea which is started taken, which, which is taken up by a lot of South African constitutional court judgment, you cannot really put it as religion, but it is also something which is not really quote unquote secular. You know, so it's a very interesting uh, category. So you can find it in different cultures. So my point is this, that one need not say that it is it is completely untrue that you know there is a different kind of that that the religion or the way of the way of imagining faith in the sub south asian subcontinent was different from the way you understand standard religions in europe okay and they became dominant obviously because of colonization it's like europeans who are ruling a all over the globe. So, so in that sense, this is a different genre. That's something which is which, which no one denies. But now the, the slip which happens, I think, is when we sort of try to push this as an argument to justify every aspect of Hinduism, when we sort of, if you allow me to use a slightly difficult word, when we make a Manichaean axis, sort of when we make this hierarchy, that, oh, it's different, it's a different genre, so it's great, it's superior, you know? And the moment you do that, especially in our context, like by our context, I mean, when where a majority of population is Hindu, so you are almost, instead of making a analytical argument that there is a, there is a world where religion was not seen as it is seen in a dominant way, okay? You turn it in this analytical argument into a, some kind of a hierarchy and a sectarian argument that these Hindus are superior, they're great. They're not, uh, they not like, they're they are greatly tolerant and so on and so forth. And that's a bit of danger. That's a danger sign. And I think that this is the kind of rhetoric which the court falls into that when they sort of allowed that. And, but this is the kind of rhetoric that all of us fall into. When we, when we sort of talk about Hinduism as like uh, greatly tolerant and all that. So basically there are different ways in which different religions should be, you know, one should think about them. And there's no need to make a hierarchy. And especially in the context of when nation state context, we make a hierarchy, we are on a dangerous terrain. And I'm taking so long to make this point because to understand that, so there is, you can't just blame a particular judgment or judge, or even I would say a political party for this narrative, because this narrative somehow we are taking forward from the very beginning. And uh, which is of this sort of Hinduism. And so you, you see that. So uh, Supreme Court quotes uh, Radha Krishnan, Sarvapali Radha Krishnan, who, who's again said something like this, that this is, so, so again, one has to understand it that it, it's a deeper thing. So if we want to diagnose this and you use psychoanalysis, so we need to really go deep right at the birth of the nation state, that we, that that's where it's starting. It's to think that it's starting now, it's starting now things have gone wrong and everything was so beautiful. 
is to just do pop psychology as you know uh, on on which, which which means that you're not really interested in the deeper malaise mm -hmm. now the legal part so so basically i hope you get my point that i think it's a very problematic way of thinking and i'm i'm not obviously reiterating the basic things that have been said that Having that obviously now Hinduism and Hindutva are two different categories because Hindutva or Hindutva as a whatever, you know, this is a category which has itself a political history to it, you know, and it has a certain kind of a history which is nation state based, like Savarkar would be very keenly talking about, you know, as a, as a Hindu nation. So, for example, there's a very interesting debate on when India is named. So, so Savarkar used to, so the, 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 the term Hindostan, okay, the Hindostan, which was a song we generally sing, Sari Jahan Se Achha, Hindostan Hamara. So there was a very interesting debate about this because this song, interestingly, is written by Alama Iqbal, who was the, I mean, we know that he was the national poet of Pakistan. That's a bit of a problem. <laughs> Many people are aware of this, you know, when, when they sing that song. But more interestingly is this that when we say Hindustan, so that this stan, this terminology stan, has Arabic uh, connotations. And there's a very recent work on this, which is a brilliant book, actually, by Manan Asif, a Pakistan-based historian. It's called The Laws of Hindustan, The Invention of India, uh, where he and also many other writers have shown that actually it's interesting that Hindustan, stan is a sort of suffix which is very Arabic in nature, like Kazakhstan, you know, Pakistan. So, which has, which is, which is different from the, uh, which is different from the, the, the Hindi, the sort of Sanskrit genealogy word we use, sthan, you know, which means a place and so on. And Savarkar was very conscious of that, which is why I think Savarkar is a very serious thinker, and one should not dismiss him the way generally we, like certain kind of left thinking dismisses him. So Savarkar is very conscious of that. And he says that we should not call it Hindustan. We should call it Hindustan, okay? And by which, and this emphasis is not just about linguistic nicety. Savarkar wants this place to be a place for the Hindus. So the land of the, like, you know, Punya, Punya Bhumi, as he calls it, like virtuous land and, and so on, which is sort of interesting. So it goes way back to those debates. And basically he's having a very intellectual thinking and which we should, I disagree with him, but I'm, I'm saying he knows this which many of us are unaware of this sort of final uh, nuances and so on. So, which is why it's important to trace this genealogy and, and, and understand that this is something we generally are a victim of. So it's an interesting way how things function. Now coming to the legal part. And so th that will make a bit clear uh, if I'm you know going a bit all right. So I think that will ground me a little. Now the legal part is interesting because Lawyers have to also base their argument on a certain kind of a legal style. So you have previous judgments, precedents, and so on and so forth. So one of the precedents which Justice Verma in these so-called Hindutva judgments okay, uh, relies upon extensively, three pages he cites, okay, uh, is a judgment on which I would like to speak for two minutes by the name of Yagna Purusadji versus Muldas and whatever that is, but that is a judgment somewhere in the 70s, given by another judge called Justice Gajendra Gadkar. So now this is, this is the first time possibly, at least this is the sense we get. This is the first time when Supreme Court gave a discourse on Hinduism. That's why it's an important judgment, I think, to look at, okay, Yagnapuru Sadji. This is the first time when the Supreme Court def not just defined Hinduism extensively, but also quoted Bhagavad Gita as a part of the Supreme Court judgment. And that those famous passages that God will come back and so on uh, in this judgment. So what is, and, and, and this is the judgment thirdly, which, where the Supreme Court for the first time said that Hinduism is a way of life, which is what is picked up by the Supreme Court again, because the lawyers have their own archive. They somehow, at least they want to believe that they are innocent and insular from the world, which is a lie, but that, that they live that fiction very well. You know, we, we know we know that, you know. So, so they, they don't want to say that, you know, the, the people who are cited are judgments and all these things. 
So let's go to Yagna Purusaji, and I would like to contextualize your question from psychoanalytic perspective also. What is this judgment about, which is cited extensively by the Supreme Court? This is a judgment which is answering a very interesting question. The question is, temple entry legislations have started coming in India, that you, you cannot stop Dalits from entering temples. And the Supreme Court is saying, and the question before the Supreme Court is, because one of the, one of the sect who, who are satsangis, okay, who call themselves satsangis, Swaminarayan sect, they were trying to say that we are not Hindus. So again, a very fascinating judgment by all counts, I think, because you would be a bit surprised that somebody in India would argue in the Supreme Court that we are not Hindus, you know. But why would they do that? They were doing this to bypass a constitutional requirement in Article 25 to be that all temples should be thrown open to all sections of Hindus if they are of a public character. So they were trying to say that we are not Hindus at all. We are not Hindus because we have certain different kind of, we don't worship certain things. We worship our own, uh, the person, uh, so we worship Swami Narayan, we don't worship I idols and so on. But the point being, they were saying, that since we are not Hindus, therefore this temple entry legislation is not applicable to us because it applies only to Hindus. So in other words, simply they were saying we would not let Dalits enter the temple, even if for that we have to successfully argue that we want to take a divorce from Hinduism, you know. So this was the point. Now the, the so Supreme Court has to answer this question that, that are they Hindus or not? In this context, the question comes, what is Hinduism? And there's a long discourse on Hinduism and so on. Now, this judgment ultimately decides that, no, you are Hindus. So this is how the judgment ends, that, no, you are Hindus, because Hinduism is a very broad idea. It's a way of life, so, and, and so on. So, so you can't bypass uh, the temple entry legislation. You can't just sort of play this uh, discrimination game uh, because you are Hindus, OK, and, and, and so on. Now, this judgment has two strands, and I want to focus on them because unfortunately not much is said about this judgment. I mean, this, people have written on this, but not so carefully as I think they should. One of the strands of this judgment is this kind of eulogy of Hinduism, that Hinduism is not a religion, it's a way of life, and it is amazing, okay? And, uh, and as I said, quoting Bhagavad Gita, that reformers come, okay, yada yada dharma se, whenever things go wrong, Lord come back. So the reforms keep happening, but you know, it, it remains. So it, 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 Hinduism is a very broad category, broad enough to even take these people who are saying we are not Hindus. And uh, they, so th there's a long discussion on Hinduism and citing Sarvapalli Radhakrishnan, citing Monir Williams and all kind of work and so on. And then there is a second strand of this judgment, okay, which is obviously trying to focus on the fact okay, that Hinduism has contradictions, you know, and that's where I come back to psychoanalysis. So this is a very interesting judgment because on the one hand, there is this holistic view of Hinduism presented, that it is some perfection, like God created perfection. But on the other hand, the same judgment is showing to us because historically, that there is a, there is a crack in this story. Okay, there is a crack in this narrative of Hinduism. There is a contradiction there. There's a lack there. And that lack is the question of caste. Because, and, 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 and this is the constitution. This is not like you can't deny that. Because on the caste question, Hinduism is not so amazing. Otherwise, the Indian constitution need not specifically have a provision to say that you have to throw open the temples for all sections of Hindus. It's a, it's a constitutional mandate, conscious of the fact that religion in India and caste are not separate. They are interestingly entwined. So my point is that this judgment in some way, the outcome of it is this, that you cannot stop Dalits because Hinduism is a broad category and way of life. And at some level, this judgment should be read as acknowledging Hinduism having a crack 
acknowledging hindu acknowledging the fact that hinduism which is a great religion is also capable of greatest violence because it can degrade human beings into non human humans and do not allow them entry right and this is something which obviously uh, ambedkar is very well conscious of so this judgment has these two strands and what is interesting is to me that the justice verma judgment completely lets go of the other strand so they they only talk about that how beautiful hinduism is how it is a way of life and they completely miss out on the other and this is i it's a very serious faux pas it's a very serious mistake even within the lawyer circle so lawyers should sort of say that what are you doing and and this is where you see the crack of hindutva judgment very clearly because there is so I, i'm sure that the judgment if you read it carefully is also sort of somewhere knowing that they are really repressing uh, you know i'm using a term from psychoanalysis one part of yagna purushad ji and that's why they just cited it even despite the fact that yagna purushad ji case and which is why i took so much time has nothing to do with elections it's a it's a completely different judgment in the context of temple entry legislation and this is a judgment hindutva judgment is a judgment in the context of election in the context of a very different statute so there is these are apples and oranges in some ways so this pick this picking up of this judgment and this taking up one strand from it is deeply problematic so i am saying actually that in this sense it's psychoanalysis is important to notice that we have to notice the crack in this story of everything perfect the 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 the, the unconscious of you know of, of this and this crack if we take seriously then i think ananya your question can be answered like in future that 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 we have to acknowledge the fact that yes hinduism certainly is a different religion from the genre of judeo christian abrahamic uh, religion but hinduism like all other religions also has its undersides and we can see that dramatically when you raise the caste question in hinduism and we are we're lucky that we have a constitution one of the framers of the constitution who's so well aware of that so we don't need to just like this is something which is there in the constitution assembly so we, we, we luckily we have the archive to go back on that so this is my very long answer to your question that this is why i think the way i, I like the way you frame this question that religion and psychoanalysis because we have to literally think about this that there is an unconscious to the story of hinduism i am not saying hindutva hindutva is greater like that's an even worse category for me because it is militant okay uh, but i am saying even hinduism in itself has its cracks so we we need not just critique this judgment that hinduism and hindutva are different we should also say one should be a, if you really love i say it like this to, you know um, because you're saying psychoanalysis if you really love someone then you have to also be you all you have to offer tough love to that person so so if you if you if you are if you really love hinduism then you have to offer your critique also that this is a problem i see in you i i i i love you but this is that is why i tell you that there is a there's a dirty part to you and so I, so my point is actually those who are presenting a story of hinduism as something so lovely are not enough are not loving hinduism enough to say that it has a darker shade so that it can become better and i think that's something which we need to focus on to read psychoanalytically your question but it it's quite ironical also because the way you described it right now it not a lot of people do read yagna purushad ji like this and i remember um, one of the scholars have in fact said that yagna purushad ji was the example of intolerance to difference and this is the impact statement that he made and this is in spite of the fact that you any work on secularism or religion or law in india and the interdisciplinarity between the two starts with the fact that yes secularism in india is very different from the west that is a given fact you don't question that but then you go on to make these arguments where you say how can one of the critics to into, like intolerance to difference and yagna purushad ji was that how can a judge read and go in such details of religious dictas 
and that is something that shabde mala has also been critiqued on that how do you expect the court to do all of this but then you're also saying that uh, the that secularism in some way is similar to the western uh, western idea of secularism because you expect the courts to not get into these details and it's just some third party which is supposed to look at them from a far side but this is just a comment <laughs> i uh, but moving on from this unless you want to uh, yeah and i'll just yeah, i'll just because i think ananya's question has a very important part to it which which i want to clarify again because these are things which we i personally think need a serious scrutiny now and which is this that i think uh, on the one hand i think you're right that a lot of people have read it in odd ways okay and for example you mentioned somebody reading yagna purusad ji in a very bad way jacobson whom i really respect actually thinks yagna purusad ji is a very good judgment and he calls it to be a judgment representing what he calls a meliorative secularism you know and and i think i really think jacobson is a very good writer and uh, his is the book which I, he says that is called the wheel of law a uh, comparative constitutional study but again my which is why i'm emphasizing that there are these two strands so you can't just romanticize yagna purusad ji you cannot just think that it is very really bad there is a this is the problem that and, and this is again uh, very, uh, very interestingly uh, psychoanalytic because this is the fundamental point of psychoanalysis that you just cannot think of all bad or all good which is not like a cliche that no white black but gray but a very but a even but a very painful point that even the best of us have our underside and even the worst of us have you know there are texts are texts have difficult possibilities of great amelioration and great violence the same text and 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 the second point ananya which i think really needs uh, emphasis is that i am actually thinking that i personally feel that in the coming days we will rethink about the way we in a cliched way talk about secularism okay and in in, in and i and i remember here talal asad who very usefully in his very classic book called formations of the secular have said that we talk about secularism but we don't talk about the idea of secular you know and he sort of uses the idea of foucauldian notion of genealogy to say that which he defines in this way that we should go back from the present moment and see the contingencies that have created the present moment but we take the contingencies to be never contingent never accidental but like taken for granted so what is the point i am making with this difficult asat uh, and foco my point is simple so i am saying that one should be very conscious that when we say that secularism in india is different from the west we so let's i think we need to really focus on this statement because first of all west is generally america for us that we are basically we are saying we don't have the church state separate separation okay and like that's that's like first of all america is not everything second is a very more serious point that actually this the, the like as a student when i used to hear this from in my class classroom i used to receive it like this that okay in india is a greatly religious society and this is again a word that is used in scholarly writings that in india we have a thick conception of religion you know as opposed to the euro western notion so mike i have two points here to think if we are really saying this that by difference in indian secularism we mean that we have thick conception and if by mistake by thick conception we mean that we are more religious okay then say the modernity enlightenment west then i think we are on a very dangerous trope because then we are reinforcing the old fashioned hopefully but never things don't go stereotype okay the colonial stereotype which would say that it is only the west which is secular and these people you know the non western people are mystics and you know uh, the, like religious people they take only religion seriously economy and others are not important so we need to help them and tutelage is required so i think we need a post colonial sort of uh, questioning of this that i hope this is not what people mean when they say the conception of religion you know and i'll not say much on that maybe some other time one to because we just don't 
I've seen very good writers never qualifying this thick conception as if both the reader and author are in agreement that, okay, we are more religious, but that's dangerous. That's a, that's a deeply stereotypical idea of India. That's a deeply, uh, that's a deeply, deeply uh, like removable notion too. And the, which is why I quoted Talal Asad, that if we go back actually historically so the contingency which brings the idea of religious freedom in India, Article 25, 26, the historical contingency is actually Queen's Proclamation of 1858. So historically, the, the in Indian subcontinent, Indians, and by Indians here, I mean everyone, in Hindus, Muslims, Christians, Parsi, everyone, okay? Indians started using the term secular or religious or religion because the Queen's proclamation after the mutiny said that there will be neutrality, officially neutrality. That is the word very central in the 1858 proclamation with respect to the religious affairs. So many historians have started saying, and unfortunately legal historians are not doing that, but that's our problem. Okay, so, but otherwise historians have shown us that actually this is when Indians have to use this category, religion, religious freedom to fight against the, the, the colonial authority, because this is something that you have acknowledged that this is not your sphere. So we would use this to fight against you. We have to use the vocabulary of the other, you know, as Derrida would say that, so unfortunately, it is the colonized which has to speak in the language of the colonizer to make sense. So this is what is happening historically in the 19th century. So why I'm telling you this piece of history is not so that you become more knowledgeable. That's they're always a dangerous thing. I am saying this only to emphasize that in some way, the idea of religious freedom or even secularism has a certain kind of a Western genealogy as Assad would call it. Mm -hmm. So I'm saying it is coming in because we have to fight the British. We, we have to fight the colonial authority, which is Western. Now, obviously it is contingent, obviously it is accidental, but this is, this is it. So, so the, which is where I have a problem with very quick, both sides, the, the, the what is sort of the right, uh, you know, saying that, oh, nothing doing. We have no, all the, the idea of religion is also not Indian. It is not Indic. The idea of secularism is also not Indic. So let's go back somewhere as if we can erase the history or something. Again, psychoanalytically, you can't erase your past. It's like, okay, fine. Like I erase everything. You know, that lovely film I like, uh, which is like really good on this uh, eternal sunshine of a spotless mind. That as if we can really erase, I wish it, is, it were so easy. And on the other hand, even I think very good thinkers are falling into this very quick notion that, well, we are different. So we have to basically figure out this difference. So to me, the difference is this in some way that it's, it's very complicated origin. So it is Western too. I mean, no, not everything Western is problematic, no. Like we are talking in English, this is a Western violent imposition by Macaulay in 1930s, but that's okay. Like, as I always like generally quote Gayatri Spivak, who very problematically, but she says it, so I'll say in post critique of post-colonial reason. And she says that, well, a rape can happen and there can be a birth of a healthy child from rape. So the problem is that healthy child should not be, we can't say that healthy child is, we should attack the healthy child because it has come out of violence. But at the same time, we cannot excuse the violent act which is the basis mm. of this birth. So now and that's what she talks about when she's saying English uh, as a, the discussion on English that, well, you can't say that this is a healthy child, but at the same time, you can't deny the fact that there was a violence on the civilization by imposition of a foreign language. But now I, but now I know I'm digressing, so I'll come exactly to the point. So this is something that constitutional scholars, political scientists have to attend to that actually we, we certainly have a certain kind of a Western notion because the very word religion, somebody like even Ratna Kapoor would say is not uh, South Asian in her recent book, you know? And at the same time, we have to figure this out that yes, but it's complex because this is something which was used as a protest, which, which has become in a complicated way a part of us. So we, in one line, what I'm saying is 
that when we use words like we have thick conception, Indian secularism is different, we have to really work this out. Otherwise, we fall in very dangerous tropes of some kind of colonial, uh, you know, language, civilizational uh, rhetoric. So thank you actually for pointing this out. And I, I think this is the kind of work we need to do from all frames, from history, political science, constitutional law scholars, to think about this, that these words need to be unpacked very, back to my original point that, you know, we need to unpack certain words. But I'll stop there and take the next mm. point, question. Um, I um, think I'll take you from, okay, please go on. Yeah, I think Professor Bintel, you've unpacked a lot of things and I have a lot of questions, but I'm going to stick to a couple of them for now. Um, I found something very interesting. So I'm coming back to the first point that you made regarding constitutional veneration. And I find it very interesting that there is like a growing wave of constitutional veneration where everybody keeps asking us to uphold the constitution, uphold the law. And it's very interesting that it's the right wing itself that has taken up the stand more than ever. So even in the US or in India, uh, you see a lot of right wing politicians saying, let's go to the courts. If it's the Ayodhya issue, you know, let's settle it in the courts. Uh, and there is this affirmation and faith of the law and the constitution coming from the right wing itself. On the other hand, what we've discussed right now with the judgments that we were discussing, that there is also an increasing trend of the saffronization of courts with a lot of personal biases of the judges coloring these judgments. So my question is, is there a trend or a relationship between the two with constitutional veneration and religious veneration happening in the courts? Or how do you make sense of it? Um, and the other question is, as a citizen, how do I uphold my faith in the judiciary? Um, is there a mechanism through which these personal biases that judges bring into their judgments can be weeded out? Or do you think it's an individual uh, sort of a personal bias that's stemming into the system or is it more like a systemic failure? Is it a failure of the institution of the judiciary itself that these judgments, not just the judgment that we were discussing, but also a lot of cow veneration uh, judgments that the Rajasthan bench or the Ayodhya bench has been passing in the, in, in the recent years. So how do you make sense of this phenomena? Yeah, so thank you, Pooja. Again, very, uh, very, very incisive question. And I'll try to be brief because that's my problem. I go beyond the script. I mean, I just speak a lot. So I try to be, uh, I try to be laconic because they're very important question. And the first, I, I'm reading your questions into three parts and rather breaking it. So the first part is something that I'm thinking of late and it has many thinking for the strands. And I'll just open this up. And let me try to answer your question holistically by that this question wants us to think about the idea of veneration or faith as such. And I like the way, and, and also look at this very interesting framing that on the one hand, we are talking about constitutional veneration. And then you later ask, how should I have the faith in judiciary now when it is becoming very, as you say, saffronized. So first, now going back to the breaking your question, first question of constitutional veneration. So I personally feel, Pooja, that this is such a fascinating question right now and so important for all of us, all of us as students of law and political science and history to think, because I think you're very right that in some ways we have, we have, we have this category of faith is so deeply etched into our psyche, as if we are so deeply wedded to the notion of faith, that even in modernity, even in post enlightenment era, we need a certain kind of a faith document. So if we don't have the Bible, we can have the constitution. Okay, if we don't have Bhagavad Gita, we can like displace it into the constitution. So this notion of displacement, that faith's not going anywhere in modernity, but just becoming, like taking a new shape, you know, is to be scrutinized. Three ways to, to answer, to, 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 for you to think and for us to think. One is that I think today constitution has become a document across the like dominant frame, which is something beyond any thinking, beyond, beyond critical thinking. 
okay and i should clarify because we are living in a world where the we are living in such a positive thinking world where even uttering the word critical sounds like negative to people so i should clarify following judith butler that critical or critique is not about fault finding or destroying or negative but actually critique is about thinking about the place where we are standing rethinking about the frames from which we think okay or figuring out what is the land beneath our feet where is it that we are coming from you know so in this sense of critique as the original idea in german which is not so for, not just about fault finding okay so i think we need to think about the fact that we are uncritical of the constitution so you 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 have no space i don't see it in the law schools i don't see anywhere where you are talking about crit, where you are critiquing the constitution and again using the word critique in a very consciously brought away okay we're critiquing the constitution what do i mean and and i think you explained it very well that today we need to think about this that constitution has become and 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 very good that today's discussion really flows very well on that so as if what i was talking about hinduism in yagna purushad ji case that a crackless absolute perfect uh, idea which has no crack no contradiction no unconscious as if the same has now happened to the constitution that this is something which you don't find cracks in or if we find them we at least hide them fill them quickly you know this is something which does not have an underside this is uh this is like uh, a, a love of which you know which is like a uncritical love to the constitution or something and that's where again i think back to psychoanalysis it's very important for us to think that this kind of a veneration first of all is a very recent phenomenon secondly it is extremely dangerous okay and i want to take you back uh, and i'll 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 take you back to two debates on this but by recent and i'm not like i'll i'll let you read that so the fact that a lot of constitutional historians who are not the mainstream but very important have actually started saying that this whole idea of constitutional romance okay as one of the very important constitutional scholar aziz rana who teaches at cornell and who i surprisingly whenever i mention him nobody has heard his name he has brilliantly shown that actually the idea of constitutional romance is a idea which has come into united states post first world war and it is only ascending with george bush in 2004 declaring constitutional day as a national holiday okay and one should also think about that how we have also changed the name of law day to constitutional day very recently in 2015 so but but these sort of small information apart my larger point is this is something which i don't think is this is not again this is not a taken for granted fact so i would like to tell you for instance that in united states context there is an interesting debate between two of their very useful and important founders thomas jefferson and james madison where thomas jefferson and madison were debating about how should we look at the constitutional text should we should this be reverential and this is an interesting point because like should can we be critical of the constitutional text and james Ma madison was saying that we should be absolutely critical we should be absolutely devoted to the constitutional text constitution you can't find faults in the constitution that's like a book of reverence and madison and who's very important person in the uh, us uh, context of writing us constitution madison was saying that even if you find a fault like i am saying crack then that should be discussed privately but publicly you should never do that 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 that, that oh there is a crack in the constitution and and this is unacceptable in some way and jefferson was to the contrary against him and saying that no we sh this is this if this is what we will do then constitution will become ossified then constitution will become stagnant because if we will constantly think it's great then we will never think of that you know it it may become old and we may just 
be worshiping it. So it will really become a very dangerous, uh, the dangerous way religion becomes that, you know, you just the founder is gone. Now you can't question anything. And Jefferson is constantly talking about reading constitution critically. And again, uh, which brings me back to the point. By, so Jefferson is no less a constitutionalist. You know, Je Jefferson is not an anarchist. Jefferson is a person who is there in Philadelphia and who's part of making up the US constitution. But what he's saying is, is he's talking about an attitude that you cannot have an attitude according to Jefferson, which is just looking at the constitution as a perfection. Or the way I would like to read Jefferson, I would say, Jefferson is somebody who wants to see the crack, who's okay seeing the contradiction in the text, while Madison would not. This debate, Aziz Rana, who is a US constitutional historian, sa he says it's really going away. So we don't see this debate now. And another very important th uh, constitutional thinker uh, who is talking about this for those who are interested in this kind of work is Stanford Levinson. Stanford Levinson, in his book, Constitutional Faith, basically introduces you to this debate. And secondly, to come to our own context, I think that actually compare two of the framers, okay, and their attitudes. So for example, I generally, and I'll just say this very quickly because I'm still thinking on this, but it's an important point. For instance, think of Jawaharlal Nehru's Independence Day speech of Trist with Destiny. And I generally feel that if you are having a meeting rendezvous with destiny, what else, then, then things will go down like you've attained it. And this kind of a, this kind of a love and a devotion to the constitution. And on the other hand, Bhim Rao Ambedkar's constant unsurety. And, and, and now again, that which is why I generally in my, when I talk to my, in my classes, I remain very conscious of cliches. And so this is one cliche again, which you need to revive that it has become a cliche to circulate on in Republic days and Independence Day, especially Republic Day. The, the life of contradiction speech of Ambedkar, you know, that he's saying that uh, we are moving into the equality of political equality, but social and economic equality are not there in our country. And we generally circulate it by saying, okay, now, so we have to work towards social equality and uh, basically economic justice in some way. I think we need to push ourselves intellectually to read Ambedkar beyond his, uh, what he could not have seen at that point of time. That Ambedkar as somebody who's coming, unlike Nehru, okay, from a background where he's not so excited about the civil society. Ambedkar could see this fact, like a Jeffersonian fact, that actually texts are there with contradictions. So we can create a constitution, but let's not be too, like, let's not just be jumping about it. Let's hold and let's, let's be open to it, to read it critically. And and I think this is very important. And, and I sort of somehow personally, I want to see this as an interesting uh, Ambedkar uh, Nehru and Jefferson Madison debate to be, to, to think about. And I'm bringing this piece of history to just say that this is now becoming impossible to, to think of these people, that, that they added how to, what should be our attitude towards the constitution. And obviously I did not say that now Ambedkar is not, you can't say he's not a constitutionalist. He's a hard constitutionalist. In fact, Gandhi would be unhappy with Ambedkar for being so liberal and constitutionalist and law believer and so on. But still now look at this lawyer, the way he looks at the constitution and others in the, there. So to come back to your question, because it's a very important question, I think this is a point which we need to take forward, that constitutional veneration can be a very dangerous phenomenon. Because constitutional veneration, which is becoming a part of our life now, and I'll come to this how, means that you are not supposed to see it as a text, but you have to see the constitution as a scripture, okay? I would say that even scripture should not be seen like that, but basically uncritical attitude towards the constitution. This kind of thinking is going to become very dangerous because again, we are just trying to paint a picture where we are hiding the cracks. And this 
kind of language is going to increasingly justify dangerous tendencies. So, and I'll just, and I'll, because it needs a lot of elaboration, so I'll say it in very short ways, I hope I convey myself. So for example, to make it topical, I think that if you are with me, if you agree with me, that anything, if you are reading as a holistic perfection, then you're not offering it tough love or you're not, you're trying to av avoid the unconscious. Then I think the idea of constitutional morality, the way it is coming in the judicial discourse of Deepak Mehta, Justice, or, or Justice Chandrachur, or any others, okay, is in some ways, I have a question actually to law lawyers that where is the crack in this discourse? So the constitutional morality is another substitute for constitutional romance, because there is a morality of the constitution, which we know, and that is unnecessarily progressive, necessarily amazing, necessarily transformative, and you can add adjectives. But constitution, if we read as I want to read Ambedkar, then I think constitution has tensions. So constitutional morality can be dignity from the preamble, and constitutional morality can also be integrity of the nation state. Okay, unity and integrity of the nation state. So if so, so, so there are different aspects. So tomorrow you can also, and to your second strand of your question, you can also justify securitization because of unity, because of integrity. And one can say this is constitutional morality. And which is not to say throw away the idea, but which is to say that we need to think about it. Like we have to give, offer tough love to constitution. So I think law, like even non-lawyers with this new fangled constitutional morality need to be a little conscious of what is it that we are hiding. So I am in, I think uh, Pooja that I am absolutely with Sanford Levinson who says that it is a very wrong way to read the constitution as what he calls civil religion with this kind of a faith, constitutional faith. We need to read the constitution critically, which does not mean finding faults, but which means like we be offering love, that I love you enough that I can see your faults and I can say them to you, okay, not others will say. So this is, uh, I think, extremely important for us to sort of remember. And very quickly, I will come to the third strand of your question, which is that you are right. So I think, yes. So for example, criminalization is a dangerous trend that is happening. And, and now, I want to say that, look at the irony here uh, on your question, okay? That for example, in the, now, now article 48 is constitution. So this is also not like, nobody can say this is not constitutional morality to basically protection of cow because it is article 48 of the, it is a directive principle of the state policy. Now what is happening with article 48 is, that we are really going and making laws which are extremely, extremely coercive, which are having punishment for six years, death penalty and so on, okay? And you rightly mentioned this legislation. So, and I will mention one to see the fascinating part of it. Maharashtra Animal Protection Act was amended in 2015, okay? And, and various amendments happened in which their possession of, Beef, okay, uh, cattle flesh was an offense. Transport is an offense. Burden of proof was reversed, and many such things happened. And this is a this is something that came to the Bombay High Court, which apparently gave a judgment that is applauded by most of the people, okay, including the, uh, just well, not justice but H. Nurani, that it's a great judgment. Now, Bombay High Court judgment is a good judgment because it at least said that you can't ban. It said it's unconstitutional to ban even if you're getting cattle from some other state into Maharashtra or even from some other country, the legislature banned it, banned it and punishment, okay? So the court said that's wrong. The court said burden of proof reversal is wrong. But the court said to like, just to say, but at the same time, the court said that possession of cattle is okay. You, this is wrong and you can criminalize it provided it is conscious possession. So the legislature was saying, even if you don't know, then you are know what lawyers call, you know, intention element, mens rea, which is, you know, uh, in technical term. So the legislature was saying, court said, okay, it should be conscious. Second, 
police is given the power to search you on mere suspicion. And now we all know about criminal law. If we know one thing, even if we are not criminal lawyers or not law student, that process is the punishment. That sometimes you can just this whole arrest and you're going to the court and you're going to a lawyer, this can kill you. You don't need the trial, like a perfect Kafka you know, moment. So in this sense, the law was saying that the suspicion is enough for the police officer. The Supreme, the, the High Court, Bombay High Court in a progressive judgment said, no, suspicion should mean not just any suspicion, but doubt. This is, I'm quoting from the judgment. Now it's very, I'm, I'm surprised here. Like, what do you mean by doubt here? And how is doubt different from suspicion? Instead of saying that this is like, what are you talking about? Like there should be a reasonable basis for searching someone. They just passed it off. So my point is that actually this attitude is really, so it's not just the legislature, but also the courts, which are in some way falling into this trap of uh, coercive laws. And the irony here is that with respect to Article 48, that Ambedkar and Gandhi would agree, never agree mostly, you know, like we know their debate. But if one thing on which both of them were together, okay, together in a, like my way, like obviously Gandhi was never in the Constituent Assembly, but together in a sort of imagined way, is that both of them said that cow protection should never be coercive. It should be a non-violent act for Gandhi and for Ambedkar, he convinced the Assembly, which is why he said it should be in part four, not part three. Now, it's interesting that how the way for like the descendants of Gandhi and descendants of Ambedkar, okay, or at least everyone is now a descendant of Ambedkar and Gandhi, at least Ambedkar these days. So then how they have in a way annihilated their, uh, you know, original intent. And this is like uh, violent, uh, you know, legislations are going on. Finally, very like to take this point very seriously now so that I can, it will connect you to my previous discussion. So my point is actually what the courts can do is that they can talk about that criminal law is not the first resort. So you, if you want to protect cow, you can also say, okay, fine, you can, this is, this is prohibited. There is a fine, okay, the, you, which, which, which is given or other ways that you will be, but saying punishment and not just six months, six years of punishment for possession. Now, this is a dangerous tendency, which a lot of people across the world have started questioning. And they, they call it the preventive turn in criminal law, that everything should be preventive. We think that let's make something a crime and things are sorted. And this is a dangerous way of thinking. So courts should start saying this. Okay. And last point uh, on which you should think. So my, my, I would like to say one judgment, if everyone, even non-lawyers know today, about decriminalization okay and uh, obviously i'm not going to talk about uh, i'm not going to talk about naftej because that's not decriminalization and let's leave it for some other day right now is joseph shine case a, a judgment where the supreme court decriminalized literally one provision of indian penal code of adultery which was pathetic so actually those who have not read law do not know that it is not just adultery, but it's some kind of a mad provision, which uh, was worse than Old Testament when it used to say thou shall not have committed adultery. So the Supreme Court stuck it down, 497 of the Indian Penal Code. Now, what is sad for me, of course, I love that judgment now. That's a judgment which has feminists being cited and good, that good that, you know, court is talking feminism at least, but we need to just not talk. We need to think. So basically one problem that I found is that this is a judgment where we are talking about constitutional morality. This is a great moment where the Supreme Court could actually have given a good discourse on that actually crime, criminal law is not the first, but the last resort. And there's so much literature, so much literature in law. Andrew Ashworth, Henrique Carvalho, I mean, so many lawyers who have written on this that no, crimes, criminal law should not be the first resort. Then, if you're interested in feminism, which I hope they are, then this is a great moment to cite Jan Thierry. This is a great moment to talk about Prabhakoti Swaran, who are dying and telling people that we do not want the feminism, which is some kind of a securitization and governance feminism. So this, we could have really created this kind of constitution. I mean, you maybe we should not call it constitutional right, but a simple point that we are decriminalizing something 
because we are against the idea of everything to be sorted through crime. And that can become a basis for a certain subtle message that, well, don't go on criminalization route, but not a word on this kind of notion. So this is where I'm a bit scared that we can, we are not really serious uh, uh, about this. So I think Pooja to come to a, a, like a, a simple answer to your very important question, I would suggest that yes, constitutional veneration or romance can become a sure short way actually soon of increasing securitization, increasing repressive laws. And therefore we need to rethink about our transformations, okay? And we have to rethink actually about the category of constitutional morality. So I'm not saying we have to give it up. I'm saying we have to rethink about it. And if you allow me to say this, you should, we have to rethink about that how is constitutional morality different from constitutional romance? How, is there a crack in the story? Is there an unconscious there? Is there something which can have dangerous trends like it is happening in other jurisdictions like United States and others, okay? So this is something I think is a fascinating point and very unfortunately, I do not think that we have we are thinking on this line. So which is why I wanna take so much time on this question because if anyone thinks that this is not a question of religion, I think it is very much a question of religion. Because I think this is what is we, it, this is what we have taken from religion, unfortunately. I would say the wrong reading. That we think that we should just become a devotee very quickly. Like let's devote ourselves to someone. And let's devote and just stop thinking actually. I should have a, somebody who should just be my shepherd. While I, and, and, and so if it's not God anymore in post-enlightenment era, so okay, fine. This is a constitution, this is constitution. Something, some kind of a panacea, some kind of a panacea where we can just become, become faithful to. And I think this is precisely what we need to fight in today's uh, moment. That, 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 that this, is, this is, so religion in a very odd way is coming back the idea of faith in a very bad way. And sort of quickly to come to your th last part, which I have not addressed. So, so that's why Pooja, I don't think that when you ask the question, should we have faith in the, how do we have faith in the judiciary? So actually we don't need to have faith in the judiciary. We need to rethink about this category of faith and by which I am not saying we should not expect judiciary to do good things. I'm simply saying, yes, it is systemic. So we, it is not about one bad judge or good judge. This is not about some great judge who's our savior or some bad judge whom we can attack, but it is about the structural problem that how we are devoted. Like, and, I, and I'm like, I'm writing something so, so which will soon be out on how cow protection laws are, even doctrines becomes a doctrines of faith. So we have started saying that we will look at every law first by presuming it to be constitutional, presuming it to be innocent. And in the context of cow protection law, there are many moments. So there are only seven to eight judgments of Supreme Court since independence in India, okay? And many times the court said, well, we will presume everything to be constitutional, even when the legislature's court is saying this, that the legislature is acting sectarian on biased, but still constitutionality. So what kind of faith is this in the doctrine of presumption of constitutionality, which, is, which can't be dispelled at all? I think all these questions, you know, we need to think. Uh, uh, in, in the context of your question. I'm able to sort of respond to Pooja your questions to an extent, you know? Yes. And yeah. yeah, I'll generally say something like before we start our next question. So my problem with me is that I want to really, like I'm trying to do a job of critique in, and in, in that sense, sometimes you may find that I'm really an anarchistic, that I'm trying to attack everything that we hold on to. Okay, so, but I'm really, I, I'm really mean it that we are really requiring serious thinking and which we have stopped doing. We have somehow, we have somehow started believing that, okay, there are solutions we all have. We just need to apply them and there are people who are coming in the way. This is not true. <laughs> it's, it's, it's not true. We, we don't know, like, you know, what, what to do. 
So, but this is, I know this is the part, I don't tell it to my student, but for you, I'm telling you, this is the part that makes me very difficult because the moment I see, like, for example, in my classes, that people are getting that, oh, yes, this is it. I try to destroy that. And then they feel that he's crazy, you know, so like, <laughs> unless you are Aranya, you know, still <laughs> stays on that, okay, fine. Okay, but sorry for this. Let's come to the next question. Uh, yeah. And this was a question that I've only recently thought about. So I don't know. So, and I recalled it uh, just now while you were talking about constitutional veneration. And I, I don't know how to think about some, something like constitution being uncritical about it because we often forget that the history and most writings of constitutional law based on just constitutional assembly debates. They don't go behind that or they don't go, they don't think about the fact that there was a history prior to it. And this is something that last semester only in one of my lectures we spoke about. Uh, and I was just thinking about how the very first session of our constituent assembly in 1946 was based on a certain exclusion and the exclusion of Muslim League. The fact that and that exclusion, exclusion was on the very form of, of the Muslim League, and that was on the very form of the Constitution, not related to religion, sure, but I don't think that that question is also unrelated to religion because uh, that whole issue was on the representation of Muslims, and it's because that disagreement and the fact that partition did happen finally. Um, was based on the very form of the constitution or whether there should be a unitary form of government or whether there should be grouping that's not the concern here but keeping that history in mind and everything that followed in those in the 10 years that have preceded the partition it's very difficult to think about our constitution now being this perfect document where um, the prime minister is coming in going down in front of it as if it's some holy book and um, people thinking that everything within that constitution is supposed to be sacred and you and even Ambedkar, the point you made uh, that 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 one speech is taken out of isolation when in fact very recently i think in last year uh, a, a professor of our college only professor nayak had written this work on constitutional morality and he'll explain how just two years before this speech Ambedkar had published another book where he said that while constitutional morality is something that uh, that's something that citizens should develop over time but the underbelly or the violent part of it it can the same morality can be used to um, support a governance structure where the already established higher caste of Brahmins could gain power over and over again and maybe the under underprivileged uh, sorry uh, the Dalits would never come to power because of this constitutional morality so my question to you then is that but, and you spoke earlier about this thing I noted down how you can't erase everything. So when you do talk about constitutional morality now, how do you, and Ambedkar itself is a very difficult person to understand, and how do you even erase the history that has preceded the constitution, the very exclusion the constitution is based on, and how do you erase these, and I think the second part of the question that I'm just going to say you answered is, and how do you even erase the many contradictions that Ambedkar has had not just in the context of the Constituent Assembly speech? Yeah, that's a very good question. That's a very good question. And I think, and I'll try to be, uh, I'll try to be brief also that we can think more. And I should also train myself to not talk too much. So I think your question is touching on the heart of the idea of religion and law. How? Because I think you're right in this way that in some ways, so I, I would actually amend myself. I am not saying that you cannot erase everything. I am psychoanalytically correcting myself. You can't erase anything, which, which, which means that things have traces and which does not mean that they would drive you. That simply means that you have to understand and struggle and figure out how they are affecting us, things which are a part of our life. So basically you are right that there, we, we don't talk of, let's be, say it in three ways, one, we don't do a robust history and, you know, which is, so in our judicial judgments, in our writers, okay, uh, who write in law, who write in political science, it seems, and especially the lawyers, it seems that things started with the constitution or the constituent assembly at best. And as if we don't go back, and if we go back, then we go back in a very boring way, as if we are sort of the facts to be thrown at us that there is William Bentick and they, they know Hastings MP. 
So we don't see anything. Like even this part is not something which we understand that how it's a very complex entry of religious neutrality in India. Okay, a very, very complicated debate. So we don't. So yes, you are right, I think, that con we need constitutional historians to attend to the history. Maybe we are too new, actually. I mean, though we are, you know, 70, but still, you know, maybe we need this, uh, a lot of work on history. And, and I think you gave a very good cue that to understand exclusions in some ways, who, and inter because they come back to us. So for, for example, you're right uh, that Partition is a silence of in Indian constitution and in the constituent assembly, which is what led to Muslim League sort of, you know, they, they like a whole debate, this assembly is divided now after the decision was taken. And there is a silence there. So, and, and I generally say it in a very, you know, uh, like, but serious meaning serious, that it, there's a silence of the violence. So the founding moments are very violent and partition is the bloodshed which we, we want to really be quiet about it. Maybe it's too traumatic to talk and we don't know what to do maybe. But they, these things come back actually, which is why we, we have to understand this history the way you are saying. Let's take the example of American constitution. So for example, if you read someone like Akhil Reed Amar, okay, or even Cass Sunstein, it doesn't look like as if there is a massive exclusion in the United States founding moment of 1787. Okay, the blacks are not voting, slaves are there, who are obviously not voting, but not even considered human. Women are obviously far from to, to vote at that point of time, and only people with property could vote. So there is a very interesting, very, very violent moment, uh, and very exclusions are amazing. And these exclusion, and, and I, I sometimes wonder how they come back. So for example, go 100 years later, Lincoln, okay, 13th Amendment of the US Constitution, 13, 14, 15. And these same questions are back that we, so the 13th is about slavery abolished, 14th is about some kind of equality, 15th is about voting rights to the black. And mind you, even till the 15th Amendment of the US Constitution, women are still not voting, okay? In fact, even if you watch this film by, what is this, uh, 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 Spielberg called Lincoln, you will see a very interesting thing that when people are opposing 13th Amendment, so the, the convincing argument historically is that if we will allow vote, if we will allow, if we will abolish slavery, then tomorrow blacks will ask for votes. And then if blacks will ask for vote, then we have to also allow women to vote. So as if, well, that is like the ultimate sin that can happen, therefore, Let's not start at all. That's why, again, 13th Amendment. And now, despite 13th, 14th, 15th, my correction is, okay, uh, I'll continue. Despite 13th, 14th, 15th, the question of race is still there. I mean, it, it remains. So even, let's push 100 years again, like, you know, fast forward. And even in the, even when the constitution is like, even when we are in 1947, India is having their constitution, United States is still having that if you want to vote, you, you should be, there is a poll tax. So you have to pay to vote. So not everyone can vote even till the fifties in the US. Okay. And then, so my point is, look at this now, then in the sixties, you have Martin Luther King Jr. Okay. So as if, as if the question is not resolved. So the, the fundamental question of race, which is at the founding, is not resolved despite the 13th, 14th, 15th Amendment, is not resolved again that Martin Luther King has to uh, join Lyndon Johnson in 60s, okay? And it still comes back. So basically, sorry for this very long sort of constitutional uh, snapshot of US, but my point is, this is what I mean that you can't erase that until we engage with traumas, they are going to exclusions, they are going to haunt us in very bad ways. So yes, I think we need a reading, a reading of history. And to the final point of your question, so yes, um, I think it's time to read Ambedkar well and to see that, see, we, we like to, uh, somebody who's so conscious of not deifying even the constitution. So even a document which is like his labor of his love, he's saying, no, let's not be too enthusiastic about. So he is somebody whom we should not deify him. So the problem is that Ambedkar is so brilliant that 
the worst thing that we can do to Ambedkar is to say that we will not see uh, Ambedkar's contradiction. We will not offer tough love to Ambedkar. So basically, I agree with you that we have to really see that how, what are the historical points, what are the contradictions, and how, how do we deal with this? But we, we have stopped doing this, actually. And this is something, uh, the last point, which is an additional point I wanted to make, that this is something which is not, not the part of the way even religion was understood. So critique is something which is immanent in religion. Like, and I was just, just one example I will take, because we have forgotten this, because today this is a big problem that if you, even the idea of reading someone and someone's contradiction is seen as if we are really, you, you know, you are doing some blasphemy or something. So if you say that, well, you know, if you say you have a problem, then I should say, oh, then you're a bad student. What is this? So let's go, let me take one example from the Buddhist canon. So for example, there's a very interesting debate about how, the, how people would imagine the inner world. Okay, Augustine will imagine, Aquinas will imagine different parts of the world. So in India, Buddhists used to say that it's, and it's a very interesting philosophical debate, that your inner self is some kind of a, it's some kind of a illumination, which is where we get the word enlightenment, no, light. So you are illuminating. But this is not a light like you see outside because it has a source. This is a self-illuminating. So your inner self, awareness in Buddhism is self-illuminating. So it illuminates itself. Okay, this is how the inner self is, according to the Buddhist canon, like Buddhist writers, like Dharma Kirti and many others. Now, one excellent Buddhist thinker, Nagarjun, okay, who some people say is like the Derrida of the Buddhist times. Nagarjun wrote that, and he's writing to, to his own peers, that this is complete nonsense. Why? Because Nagarjun said, that the idea of light, the idea of illumination, enlightenment, the idea of light cannot exist without the context of darkness. So when you say that this is something self-illuminating, this is something which is just has no source, it is just illuminating. So Nagarjun said, this doesn't make sense at all. Because nothing, it, the, when you say illuminate, you're basically talking about darkness because illumination is the opposite of darkness. So you, this is not making sense. But anyway, we, we, I'm not going there. I'm saying that, so what Nagarjun is doing is, he's completely taking away as if from the foundation, the idea that is dominant in Buddhism. But he's a Buddhist thinker. So, 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 so I hope you see the point that if he, he's completely ripping apart that, okay, you are completely wrong. Every one is wrong who's speaking like this. And this is my argument. But this is a Buddhist thinker who's saying that. So this is something I want to say is completely somewhere or the other getting lost. This is critique for me, actually, in some ways, you know. And I think, Ananya, to come to the final point of your question, history, if read well, the, not the way we read history, if read properly, is by definition critical. So if we are able to historicize things, we are able to see them uh, you know, uh, in, in a critical fashion. And it's so much needed. Because today we are in somehow in a very bad way, okay, becoming used to not able to think, but just devote ourselves. And this sort of reminds me, and this will be a good way to sort of come to an end, maybe one more question. This, this reminds me of a very beautiful passage in Dostoevsky's Brothers Karamazov, where Christ has come back Okay, and, uh, and, 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 the, and the priest sees him, he says, who are you? And he says, I'm back, second coming, promised, I'm here. And then the, Dostoevsky is brilliant to show that actually the priest calls the police to arrest this man because Christ will be too radical. And then in great ex executioner chapter, I think, Dostoevsky shows that Christ is seeing the people who have become complete devotees, okay, total devotees. And Christ is very sad. And he gives very brilliant words, Dostoevsky, to Christ. That I, I didn't, I, I wanted, I wanted, I did not want slaves. I mean, I thought that you will, I wanted to like bring light to you. I wanted you to become thinking people. I wanted you to think. You have like, but I have like, this is, I have, so it's like a betrayal, as if devotion is a betrayal 
you know i think that's a brilliant moment in some ways of you know to think about that how devotion is actually true betrayal but we have become like this that we somehow think that no no you know and any any act of like any act any of act. thinking is uh, betrayal so it's a it's really sad and i totally agree with you ananya that we need to rethink about history we need to rethink about contradictions historically if we want to understand uh, and uh, constitution or ourselves and also that's why broadly my last point maybe then we can take one more question uh, this is the, this is why the idea of religion is important to engage with because in some ways we are stuck there in some ways some faith uh, of of certain nature and if you allow me this is like i really think that this is the message of a very very brilliant film of david fincher i think this is his best actually couldn't do better fight club because fight club as a movie is i actually watched it very recently like 5 6 years back because i used to think fight club must be some masculinity fighting happening but when i watched it it really blew me away <laughs> because it was not about it Fight Club is a film which, in a way, shows first of all how authority can be deeply entrenched. Like we can, it can like we can psychically become devotional to authority. Okay, like the 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 main character becomes to his boss, and how we need to fight ourselves if we want to fight the authority. You know, there's a beautiful scene in that film where this uh, main character hits himself. That's a very fascinating scene. The message is that actually. you need to fight the this devotion in you it's not just the authority not just the structure but we also have become in some ways and appear and the point why i chose that film to speak about it now is because the end of the film we are seeing that even this revolution can go wrong even this revolution which we are planning okay can actually end up becoming a list of devotees there's a later moment in the movie but this where these revolutionaries are you know one one of the friend has died and these revolutionaries are saying number 1 number 2 has died and this and the protagonist says he has a name he has a name he's not just a number but these are now revolutionaries who are you know there to change the world so this is what is this is what devotion is a category which one has to really think about so i think it's a very it's a very intelligent uh, way of saying it i mean one should read uh dostoevsky's brothers karamazov with fight club to sort of think about it and you know a lot one can think about so i'll stop there <laughs> um, i don't huh. really want to think all right i think we can come to um i have this question about ca and nrc so when the protests were happening um a lot of the a uh, protest methodology was reading the, of the preamble um and sort of using that as something that connects people despite their religion um so one thing was i was wondering if constitution can be seen as a forward looking document that can in a way sort of be seen as something that unites um people while also holding within it the contradictions of everything that we've spoken about but can it also be something that is useful as a protest methodology in a country as religiously divided as india and secondly i wanted to address the ayodhya judgment in which the idol was given the juristic um identity based on the illegal transportation of it within the babri uh, masjid so that is something that was also interesting given that uh, in the context of also ca and nrc given the displacement of uh, you know uh, refugees from uh, say you know a surrounding countries um, and how the executive has gone above and beyond to sort of rehabilitate these and also exclude some based on the category of citizens and people and that hence they are not entitled to uh, legal protection anymore but then on the other hand we also see them giving idols this reveration to the extent where there is a rights based discourse uh, based on idols itself so yeah yeah 
No, actually, I want to thank you, Prerna, for asking this question because, uh, like, I think your, especially your first question will help me clarify a lot of my position. You know, uh, where I stand. But I'll go in the reverse order, actually, in some ways. That uh, to, to come to the first question and the end, which is how can preamble constitution be a moment of solidarity as it happened in the protests and how it can be of use. But I'll come to the next two uh, quickly, which is the this is the whole point of the, the Ayodhya judgment idol and how the exclusion one bit. So I think, yes, it's, and, and I'll be, I'll try to be brief so that I can take some time on the first question, which is very, very important. So the second question, I think it is a very interesting thing that out of the many problems that I have from the Ayodhya judgment, and I am not like saying just because I don't like the verdict, I'm saying, as a lawyer, like the, it is an internally inconsistent. It doesn't put its money where its mouth is. It's like in that kind of a way I'm saying, not just because uh, what it did, but I think it, it, you can't do it like this. This is a very, this is one of the very obvious one that actually the court said that idol has rights and an idol is a personality. And actually the judgment says that it's a, it's a matter of convenience that in Indian history, again, it has become, that idol has become a juristic person, which means that idol is also like a person, like a company is a person, you know, so uh, not just a natural person, but idol also is a person. This is something. And uh, again, very interesting, because I think my history friends do not understand this, because many people thought that Ayodhya judgment is the first one to do this, that idol is a juristic personality. But no, I mean, I, I think all of us know that that's not the case. The Supreme Court is simply reiterating a position which is even before colonial time. The idol is considered as a juristic person. But th that's a long discussion because I think if you read Supreme Court well, the juristic court, even mosques can be a juristic person, the kind of the way they go. But somehow, you know, that, but that's a different debate. Your question is shorter. And I think the so court, after saying this, quite clearly said that it's a matter of convenience and history. And yes, but the court itself has at least at three times said that what it is very bad what happened on, on the day of installation, okay? Very bad things happened in December 22nd, okay? When the idols were installed and it was a, and they used like very, very strong word. It is something other than the due, due process of law. Like my minority community was threatened. How can you do that? This was an illegal act. So it is no question. So I'm saying even the Supreme Court is saying this, not like, some uh, someone else, but the court is saying. But at the same time, the court never asked the question that something that you are calling illegal, monstrous, extremely bad, other than the due process of law, how can that action eventually become, okay, a way of justifying? So actually, I mean, it's like a betrayal to me that, 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 that you are betraying the God because the God would not like to behave like us, no matter how much we would like them to, that they would go and enter the property of others, okay? Because we want property, but maybe God don't want property, right? So we want, the, now the court either should say that this was not, this something which happened, they appeared, okay? This something which happened legally, then I'm fine. But if you are saying this is illegal, so in a way it's wrong, you, you did something wrong in the name of God. So now how do you justify that in some way later? in this whole position. So I'm not clear about what the court is saying in, in that way. But the, your second part was nice because the way you asked this question, I only think, uh, Prerna, because I can't answer very well put actually. So thank you for that question. That how you were saying idols can have rights, but actually human beings, strangers are, some of them <laughs> do not, are worthy to have, uh, you know, uh, hospitality. That's a good question that you let me think about. And I'll just say that one should read a very brilliant piece by someone called Ranjana Khanna, called The Stranger, uh, where as she reads this idea of stranger psychoanalytically and from a feminist perspective, post-colonial feminist perspective. And she deals with the question of refugee. But I think, uh, I'll think about it, Brenna. It's, it's thank you for that question. That's a very sensitive question. So I'll think on that. And finally, coming to the first question, which should, which is, which I'm really glad you asked, because I 
no matter how I sound, and I know that I do sound different, I quite, I'm very clear that I'm not one of those who think that law is not, we, are, we have to go beyond the law. We, we, this is not going to work. I really am devoted to the idea of law. We have to work with it. Okay, so like tough love to law in some ways, right? So absolutely right. So I think, yes, you are right, which is why it's a beautiful moment. And I'm glad you brought it up that there can be a moment when preamble can become a way to come together. So law can really become a way of protest and fighting and so on, because that potential is there in law. And we have to constantly fight that. And, and, and which is why we have to stay with the law. We don't have to really give up law, okay? And no matter how much I like Nivedita Menon, but this is my only thing that her book on recovering subversion, which as you can see on the title, Feminist Politics Beyond the Law, and especially her chapter four, where she, she says, you can't deal with hegemony, okay? Law can't deal with hegemony, okay? Gramscian concept she's evoking. So I think we need to really push that a bit. And, but not, today is not the day to talk about that. But I think, no, even, even we have to think that, what do we do with hegemony then, okay? We can't, there's nothing beyond the law in that sense for me. So I think it's a good point, Prerna. We, the, and it's back to our original sort of way we began. The texts have their underside and we have to acknowledge that. But at the same time, there is a possibility which we have to struggle and not just say, we will just pick up the possibility and we will repress the other. No, but we have to acknowledge that. So there is a possibility in preambles, certainly of doing this solidarity. This is why we have to fight with the law. This is why we are reading law. This is why we are reading judgment. Otherwise we should leave law schools at least and you know, do something better actually, which is not a bad idea because law schools are becoming too much now. You know, everything is law, this is crazy. You know, so, uh, so, but at the same time, law has its extreme relevance. And, and as you said, the constitution after all has its uh, importance, but we should not forget that, that it has its other strains also. And we should not repress them. We have to engage with them, look at them, even if we don't like them, okay? And that's true. And this is like my larger point that, again, it's surprisingly psychoanalytic, which I never intended today to be the discussions part. But no matter how much we try, texts can have dangerous possibilities. So, and, and you have to look at both of them. So uh, nothing, no one is like, so, uh, no one is great. People have their unconscious. Similarly, texts. So constitution can have this great moment of solidarity, which is something we have to hold on to. And constitution can become the document to justify securitization. After all, we have preventive detention in our fundamental rights chapter, okay? Which is surprisingly very unique to India, okay? Same is true for almost any text. I mean, whether it is the Bible, and that's what Dostoevsky is trying to say, actually, that it's like, it's possible. Or it is Bhagavad Gita, for instance, which is like the becoming the book of the day now. You know, so it's a, it's a, it's important. It's an it, it is so so the way I read Bhagavad Gita in my classes is very surprising, but I on I'm honest to the text here. I read it in a way, in a very you can would say it's a very feminist way of reading it. I say that Bhagavad Gita is a text actually, which says you have to do away with the family. Because Arjun is constantly familial. That, oh no, I, you know, he's not against war. He's actually against, I can't kill my family. And Krishna is constantly saying you as if, no, you have to kill your father or something, you know, in the sense, metaphorically, that no, you can't give this argument. This is my family. This is not an argument at all. Okay. So if, if this is a possible reading, then it's interesting, you know, but, but I'm saying, but at the same time, there is, there are these possibilities, but at the same time, yes, there is a caste question. So you can't be blindfolded of that, that yes, but you have to historicize. Documents are complex. So, uh, which is why, you know, like um, you can't just do, do one thing, even the idea of nation, for example, when Lincoln was using the idea of nation in the 1800, okay, 50s, then he in a way, now think of it, I right? generally, this is something I think about, that with Lincoln, the idea of United America was actually progressive. Because what was he against? Slavery, the South, which was saying, no, we will not allow 
absolutely impossible. We will become confederate, we will leave this, but don't even think of saying that slavery is abolished. So this is a very interesting moment where actually the idea of nation can have its side. On the other hand, nation is something very interestingly complicated. Okay, so this contradiction is interesting. Another last thing I'll say that, you know, that for example, I love this debate between Len Lenin and Rosa Luxemburg. When, so, when, the, when Lenin comes to power, you know, in uh, the Soviet Russia. So L Rosa Luxemburg was against the idea of Lenin asking for, you know, this democratic nation, international right for the nation. And you, I love Rosa Luxemburg here. Because she is in a way able to really do this feminist job of looking at the contradiction of saying that, see, this is a dream now, like socialism is a dream. So I cannot, we can't, you can't have these empty rights if you are not, if you are saying that, no, we can't give freedom of speech and expression. So actually, this is a very interesting debate where Luxembourg is really, she's, by the way, she's, I think, very good and on the fact that she wants to erase fight. So she says militarization should end. We don't think of this now. We have stopped thinking. Like, I think we have stopped thinking that no war. <laughs> like, so, and, and so she was saying, you can't do this, that you're not having speech and expression. You, we, we need to have freedom of speech and expression. Although Lenin has a good point that no, we right now, everyone is against us. We are just a new thing. We will be crushed. So we need to hold on to this. But Luxembourg is saying, no, we, this is like, we can't, this dream can become a nightmare. So we, I'm against you. Very, very famous debate between the two. So, you know, in this sense, Prerna, I think Luxembourg is doing this job. She's in a way a constitutionalist for me. She's not an empty one that, okay, fine, I want a right to freedom of expression. But no, she's saying, no, like, we, we need to really certain these, you know, ideas. We need to hold on to them. And, uh, you know, we need to do that. But anyway, I'll not take more because there's a beautiful essay I would like you to re read that. In a very recent book uh, by, uh, the, you know, by Drusilla Cornell, the name of the book is Creolizing Rosa Luxemburg. It's a brilliant piece where she again reads Luxemburg with Franz Fanon and also a new sort of uh, uh, like a very famous uh, uh, like um, a black right activist uh, whose name I'm fed for just somehow off my head. Please read that essay where she talks about this very well. So this is my point actually, that in some ways we have to hold on to these liberal democratic values as even, you know, like Rosa Luxemburg is saying in a socialist moment. Otherwise this is, and, and this struggle should be on. Like we hold on to them and knowing that they can be empty. Like, you know, freedom of speech and expression can be very dangerous. Think of the context of election speech. Because this is Ram Malani's argument, actually, that you can't have a law in India saying that you can't have religious appeal because it is against Article 191A. We can have any appeal. Yeah. This is the argument of Jait Malani that why we can have any appeal, freedom of speech and expression, whatever I want, okay? Mm -hmm. Which thankfully the Supreme Court rejects. So in this way, and my point is that, yes, we should be conscious of the fact that there is an unconscious to the text, but it's a struggle that we have to fight. And very conscious of this, that our dream can become a nightmare and that should not happen. I mean, it is enough. We, have, we should learn this actually. 20th century is a classic moment to learn this. The dreams becoming nightmare, we should learn from the faults and we, we, we cannot sort of uh, repeat them. So that way I stand with you, you know, like law, like law is extremely important without romanticizing it at all. Do you want me to do like some things because I'm not used to this, like, I, okay, like. Yeah, yeah, you're fine. fine. Yeah, you're cool. Clearly. Great. Oh, great. <laughs> all right. <clears throat>